So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yash Tiwan and I'm the Director of Academic Events for the Economist Society this year. And thank you so much for joining us here today. We're extremely honored to have with us Sir Professor Collier as our first speaker for the Economics Conference. And before like, I hand over the stage to him and Professor Armendariz, I'll just give you a brief introduction about, uh, for the conference. Like, I just wanted to give you, a, uh, give you all a quick and warm welcome to the UCL Economics Conference 2020. Every year, the Economist Society tries to bring you the best economists, thinkers, and speakers from around the world to share their ideas and inspire you to explore your subject with the same passion as they have. And this year, too, we have a diverse and brilliant lineup of speakers from development economists to environmental economists, people from firms like Google and KPMG to chief economists of the Bank of England and the IMF. And the academic events team, including Vandrika Colton, Ola Kozowski, and Kadambri Singh, and myself, of course, and the larger society have been working since May to like line these events up for you. So we hope that you get the most out of this economic gala, so to say, we've tried and set up for you. Uh, we're also lucky to have with us Professor Arvind Dardis from the UCL Department of Economics, who's kindly accepted to introduce our guest speaker today. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to her and then Professor Collier can continue with his talk. Thank you so much. Over to you, Professor Arvind Dardis. Thank you very much for um the honor of uh, uh, introducing uh, Sir Professor Paul Collier, who uh, has written extensively on uh, Africa and uh, uh, all the eight agencies these days have their eyes on Africa. So no development economist can actually uh, uh, enter into uh, a debate as to why uh, things uh, in the vast majority of African countries don't work according to uh, what development economies might think that uh, they would work. So uh, many development economists think of uh, economic development as something, uh, you know, linear that goes through stages and uh, uh, that there are financial gaps to be filled in. But they disregard the political economy and uh, the conflict that can uh, you know, come about and uh, be an obstacle for uh, economic development and human development uh, 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 of the poorest of the poor and where mortality uh, rates, adult mortality rates, infant mortality rates are the highest. And uh, uh, where uh, we want to understand uh, what is the future of, uh, uh, of, of, of Africa uh, since its importance is growing uh, in, from every uh, standpoint. Professor Collier uh, has uh, written extensively on uh, uh, conflict and uh, um, in that part of the world and uh, uh, knows Africa like uh, uh, very few people uh, uh, that I know uh, no Africa. So it is uh, uh, a, a must uh, uh, to contrast his ideas with some other uh, ideas like uh, those of uh, uh, William Easterly, etc. And I had had the privilege of, uh, you know, confronting uh, some of the of his writings with those of Easterly and uh, uh, and uh, animate. Uh, very thought-provoking debates. So I hope that he will give us a, a very uh, uh, interesting uh, talk, I am sure, and uh, uh, about uh, uh, post-COVID Africa. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor uh, Collier, the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much. And thanks, Beatrice, and thanks, Yash, for inviting me. So. Um, I forgot to say that I, I never used this night, but I, I grew up in a culture where it would have been very rude to decline it and even more ridiculously pretentious to use it. So I never do. Right? Um, uh, COVID is an example of, um, of a phenomenon, a problem, a challenge, which is in which the social, the political and the economic are all intertwined. Um, and we've seen that play out within the uh, OECD economies. We've had um, some spectacular successes in dealing with uh, the COVID uh, epidemic. Um, within Europe, um, uh, Denmark, 
fantastically successful in Norway. Um, the, the disease never took off. It's not taken off now. Um, in East Asia, New Zealand, managed to get rid of it completely. Um, and we've also seen quite spectacular incompetence. Um, the, the, uh, ironically, the, what the Gates Foundation had just done a review of who was best prepared for an epidemic, and it came out the top of the, the, top of the pile of best prepared countries to face an epidemic um, with the United States and Britain. Um, and that just shows how badly misunderstood the process of actually um, uh, being able to, to, to cope with uh, an epidemic was. Right? It was viewed in a techni narrowly technocratic sense rather than in this interplay between um, political, social, and, and economic. So if we turn from this amazingly wide spectrum within the OECD, from the, you know, the, the, the truly brilliant to the truly ghastly, um, where in that spectrum do we find Africa? And um, uh, let me start with the, um, let me, well, let me start with the political. And um, uh, we've, got, we've got an example of success in Africa, um, uh, which is Senegal. And if we look at Senegal's politics, um, it's, it's President Macky Sall is really a pretty good leader. And um, which, is, uh, which is unusual in Africa. Most, most political leaders in Africa are pretty bad. Um, they um, typically, um, the problem is that within Africa, you've got societies which are either fragmented or polarized. And the political leaders are seen as representatives of their ethnic identity group rather than as leaders of the country. Um, and um, they also see themselves as being um, commanders in chief, um, uh, issuing orders, pulling levers and ordering people what to do. Um, and, um, and that means that in most of Africa, leaders are not trusted by great chunks of the population. Um, but in Senegal, um, President Macky Sall has, has managed to build a reasonable degree of trust. Um, and he, um, he reacted very sensibly. And so actually Senegal has made a better job of it than um, certainly than most of most European and North American countries, leaders. Um, but the... Um, uh, but most of Africa, leadership has been pretty poor during COVID. Um, leaders have first just copied the lockdowns in Europe. So they didn't, as it were, think from themselves. They just sort of imitated European responses. And secondly, they issued orders to their people and the people didn't trust them. And the orders were often really pretty damaging. Uh, and so you've seen riots and protests explode um, South Africa, but most obviously at the moment, Nigeria, um, uh, where the presidential behavior has led to very severe riots and deaths and what have you. Um, so the political responses have been, have ranged from the really good Senegal to the really pretty dreadful. Um, the social responses, uh, the social responses in Africa have tended to be much better than the social responses in Europe and North America. And there's a very simple reason for that. Um, and that is the, um, the, 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 the evolutionary biology concept of the um, collective brain, um, a concept um, pioneered by Joe Heinrich, I think, who's got this brilliant new book, which uh, I recommend, Weirdest People in the World. Um, um, uh, and 
the, the concept of the collective brain is that, and you find it in behavioral economics, where it's become very important, is that most of our behavior is not set by our own individual calculations based on obs direct observation of the world. That would be, wouldn't be very rational. It would be most of the time, it would be extremely inefficient. Um, most of the time, our behavior is guided by um, the opinions of our community, um, which has got a thousand eyes and many, many years to have observed the world. And so comes up with patterns of behavior, which um, most of the time, not always, but most of the time are pretty sensible. Um, and so when people meet with a new problem like COVID, what they draw on is that collective brain, which is the collective memory. And then it depends what's in the collective memory, what the, uh, what, what the, the sense of working response is. And fortunately in Africa, the collective memory uh, of epidemics was recent and very useful. So the, the, you know, in West Africa, um, you get the, um, the fear of Ebola. Um, well, Ebola was a killer. And unless you changed your behavior, um, you killed yourself and you killed others. And so people had learned from Ebola, um, if there's an epidemic, you have to change your behavior. Otherwise, you kill yourself and everybody else. And then in a lot of Africa, a lot of the rest of Africa, there was HIV. Same thing, deadly. Um, it spread through behavior. You have to change your behavior or else, or else you kill or kill yourself. And so across Africa, you saw, you've seen pretty rapid um, changes in behavior that haven't really, on the whole, come from government orders. They've come from people understanding the phenomenon and behaving sensibly. Right? And the problem in Europe and North America is the collective brain, the collective memory, um, had to go way, way back to find anything that um, it, it was outside living memory. Um, it was Spanish flu. And Spanish flu turned out to be a really, really unhelpful guide. Um, because once you start thinking, thinking of it as, oh, it's just flu, um, then you get silly ideas like herd immunity. Um, uh, you get the idea that, oh, it's just sniffles um, uh, and so forth. So, um, so it's a very, very dysfunctional um, collective memory that Europe and North America had. Um, so that was, that's the story of the political and the social in Africa. And because the social was so good, um, uh, basically um, Africa's hit directly from COVID hasn't been very severe. Um, where it has been severe is the indirect effect. And the indirect effect comes from the effect in China, in Europe and North America on the economy, the coincident recession. And a coincident recession, a deep recession, a pretty well unprecedentedly deep recession, um, a coordinated across the Western world has led to four coincident macro hits in Africa. Um, uh, one is the falling commodity prices. Most of Africa is commodity exporters, not all. Kenya is a commodity importer, and so Kenya's got off much a lot more lightly. Um, secondly, remittances. A lot of Africa depends upon remittances in normal times. And usually when an African economy gets hit by a shock, remittances go up because um, the diaspora realizes that there's something gone wrong 
and remittances go up. This time, dias this time diasporas are in no position to help because the African diaspora in the Middle East, in Europe, in North America, all tends to be in jobs which are themselves um, vulnerable to uh, COVID. And so have been um, a lot of people have lost their jobs. And so the remittance flow, instead of going up, has gone down. So we've had a big fall in commodity prices. We've had a big fall in remittances. Um, we've had a big fall in um, tourism um, and conference visits. Um, in Rwanda, I was in Rwanda in February, and the, the, one of the ministers was proudly telling me that Rwanda, thanks to its advertising campaigns, is now the most second visited country in the whole of Africa. Would amazing for such a small country without a coast. Right? Um, second most visited country in the whole of Africa. And then um, Rwandan government very sensibly said, well, with COVID, we don't want to import it. We haven't got it within the country. We don't want to import it. So sorry, nobody can come. And so they had to close down their main industry, which was which they built up as this conferences, tourism, hotel stuff, all, all just shocked, disastrous. Um, and then the fourth um, hit um, is that to do capital flows, both um, uh, foreign direct investment and um, financial capital inflows, um, uh, which, have, which, have, which have gone into reverse. So um, the the, the effect of COVID and the recession, the global recession, has been a flight to safety. A flight to safety by uh, companies, so DFIs, so FDIs collapsed, uh, and uh, a, collapse, a flight to safety in capital markets, so that no African country has been able to issue a bond since COVID. Um, and indeed, the danger is that banks will start pulling money out. Um, so that's the macro hit for Africa, those four things. And all of those hits uh, spell shortages of foreign exchange. Um, and so that's really been the, uh, the challenge for Africa. Um, if I just run with that a little bit further, um, uh, it's hit African firms hard and Africa's already short, very short of the organizational capital constituted by firms. We'll see why that's so important in a moment. Um, in the OECD, we've spent enormous amounts of government money supporting our firms very sensibly. Uh, Germany spent well over 10% of GDP supporting its firms. Um, African governments, no position whatsoever uh, to push in 10% of GDP to support firms. And so the African figure has been something more like 2%. Um, so that's the, um, that's the, uh, where, we, where we are at the moment. Um, how do we get back onto track? Um, and the, the sad thing is that, um, uh, Africa was just starting to, um, to grow more rapidly and investors, foreign investors were starting to take notice. So there was uh, an incipient um, inflow of investment interest to Africa. And that is the thing that's got derailed and, uh, and is so, uh, so serious. So what can be done about it? And I'm going to sketch a uh, a strategy at the top end uh, of the spectrum of, uh, of African um, politics, society and economy, and a strategy at the bottom end. Um, and I think it's useful to, the spectrum is so wide that it's useful to distinguish um, a strategy at the top end and a strategy, a very different strategy at the bottom end. Um, 
one of the big mistakes in the in Western support for Africa has been to fail to do that, just try to use the same approach everywhere. It happens to be you know, an approach which has not been very successful anywhere, um, but you can't use a common strategy across such a wide spectrum of countries. So the top end strategy um, I'm going to suggest is really um, to try and ignite the same process that happened about 40 years ago in East Asia. And what happened in, in East Asia 40 years ago, well understood, four little countries um, got ahead of the pack. Um, and that was uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea. Um, they adopted somewhat different strategies. Hong Kong's was very different from Singapore's. Um, they had some common features, had some common features of governance, not much really. Um, uh, but they all four hit on a, uh, something which worked for them uh, in the context of the time. And so they all started to grow quite fast. Um, and after a, a, a decade or so of growing fast, that really got noticed elsewhere in East Asia. Um, most spectacularly, um, Deng Xiaoping went to look at Singapore and thought, my God, um, we can do that, or at least we can try it as an experiment in Shanghai. You know? And then once China started to get ahead, of course, that spilled over to India. Um, and, and it's spilled all around East Asia. So now the, 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 the countries in East Asia that haven't yet started to grow fast are the exception, not the rule. Um, uh, because within a region, um, uh, just as within a community, one of the big ideas um, in evolutionary biology is that within a community, um, humans are very, very good at emulating success. We're not very good at spreading ideas between communities, but we're very, very good at emulating success within a community. Um, now there's some wonderful um, uh, experiments on three-year-old kids and three-year-old chimps trying to get them to solve puzzles. And the chimps is just as good as the kids at solving the puzzles. But what the chimps can't do, and the kids do amazingly well, is imitate a successful effort, you know. Um, so that's what happened in East Asia. It needs to happen in Africa. And so um, a good strategy will be to help um, three or four or five countries to get ahead. Um, what does success, what's success going to look like in Africa? And it's already starting to happen. Um, but what, what, what's the dynamics that really sets it off? And I think um, in, in narrow economic terms, there's a, there's a social side to this and the political side to this, but since you're an economic society, I'm going to concentrate on the economic side. The economic side is that, that uh, the path to prosperity is really the path to, product, to productivity. And that's a a one-to-one -one relationship basically between prosperity and productivity in a workforce. And um, Africa's tragedy is that although people work pretty hard, they are quite amazingly low productivity. And the sort of low productivity that was characteristic, characterized everywhere, everywhere in the world until a couple of hundred years ago. And so, um, what's the secret of productivity um, is firms. Um, and by firms, I don't mean um, a micro enterprise. Um, I mean a firm that is big enough. It's the move from two people to 50 people. Yeah. Now you can go from 50 to 500,000 and that helps as well. But it's that move from two to 50 that's decisive. And it's, it's that the sort of thing that Adam Smith noticed, right? That, and why are firms uh, of 50 so amazingly more productive than firms of two? Um, scale, 
specialization um, is the base, is the foundations. That's what Adam Smith noticed. Um, uh, one of my friends and colleagues did a study in Ethiopia comparing manufacturing firms of with four people, which is kind of a fairly big uh, informal enterprise, with firms of 50, which is a, a, the bottom edge of a, of a formal firm. Uh, comparing, make the same thing, um, side by side in, in, in Ethiopia, we can still observe it. And the workers in the firm of 50 were each 10 times as productive as the workers in the firm of four. And that's the scale of specialization. Um, now, of course, since that of Smith, it's got way beyond just scale and specialization because modern um, firms are highly interdependent, um, whether in um, clusters where the same sort of firm works together in a, in a, in a spatial cluster or in value chains where firms pass on um, and add value in a chain. Right? But, but, but in both cases, um, they're interdependent. They, they depend on each other. Um, and so modern productivity is scale, specialization, interdependence, investment, and a link into capital markets, into finance, the finance that pays for the investment. That's the package which any formal firm does. The more advanced formal firms in the OECD also do innovation. Um, but at the stage that Africa's at, although innovation is nice, you don't even need it. You just need the scale, specialization, um, uh, investment, and finance. But the problem, the problem uh, is, uh, is that we've got very few firms like that. Africa is desperately short of proper firms. Two thirds of all Africa's educated labor, its human capital, works pretty well solo. And so even the educated labor is doomed to low productivity. No scale, no specialization, et cetera. Right? So Africa, even before the COVID hit, was desperately short of proper firms. And the COVID hit is destroying Africa's organizational capital because um, its firms are being hit by this deep recession from the macro hit that hit Europe and China and North America. Um, so we start from this position of few firms and COVID is going to make them even, even fewer. Uh, quite a lot will go bankrupt. Um, so why are there so few firms? Why were there so few firms even before COVID? Um, two very distinct sets of problems. One internal to Africa, one uh, external. And the internal reasons are um, a mixture of poor governance and limited state capacity. So we go back into the, the, the sort of political. Um, and um, uh, with limited state capacity, um, what does that amount to in practical things that affect the, the discouraged firms from being there in the first place? Um, what is a lack of uh, security? Um, obviously firms uh, are scared of operating in an insecure environment. Um, turns out that it's, it's less the sort of micro insecurity of, oh dear, I might um, uh, get my firm broken into, and more the macro insecurity of, will the state get overthrown in some way? And that's the sort of big unknowns that um, turn, um, uh, turn a firm to, to, to sort of jelly of fear, um, because they can't cope with that. They can do something about protecting their own factory or whatever, um, but they can't do anything about um, uh, state level insecurity. Um, uh, rule of law um, and contract enforcement. Firms very obviously need to be able to enforce contracts. 
Uh, and for that, they need courts. Um, well, Africa's got courts, um, but um, the courts are no stronger than the judges who run them. And this is where we turn from the political institutions to the, so the, the social, the, the, the ideas and the behaviors of people who actually run those institutions. One of the most misleading statements in economics, I think, is Douglas North's statement that um, institutions are the rules of the game. Um, it's a famous phrase. Um, uh, if you think about it, um, the rules of the game are actually just that. They are rules, laws and things like that. Um, institutions um, are teams of people with a mandate. Uh, the mandate is given by the laws, but how people use that mandate, the people who run the organization, can vary enormously depending on what's in their heads. You know? um, the rules will set up a tax authority. Um, it's what's in the tax inspector's heads will determine whether they collect taxes for the state or collect taxes for themselves. Yeah. Um, the rules will create courts with a mandate and give powers to judges. It's the ideas in those judges' heads which will determine whether judges use those powers um, in the interest of the rule of law or in the interest of the judge. Yeah. I was uh, at lunch with uh, in uh, in a West African state a couple of years ago, with a uh, a journalist who wore a mask throughout the lunch, um, and the reason he wore the mask was that he um, he operated as a journalist by doing stings, and so it was vital that nobody could ever recognise him. And so whenever he went out, qua journalist, he wore a mask. So I have no idea what he looks like. Right? Um, but he did tell me that his latest sting had been on judges. Um, so he'd gone to judges saying, um, you know, this court case uh, that's coming up that you'll be presiding on. Um, well, I'm one of the interested parties. And um, I'd like to win that case. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, here's um, something um, uh, to, um, to persuade you to help me win it, right? So he had video film of 27 judges um, accepting bribes. Right? Um, that was why he wore his mask, right? Because he needed the mask not just to do the interviews, but to stay alive afterwards, right? Um, so that's, the, you know, that's, an, that's an example of the, the rule of law in a lot of Africa is weak. Um, they've all got courts, um, but unless the judges internalize the value of, um, uh, of, of decisions that actually abide by the law, um, uh, they're not really doing what it says on the tin. Um, so security, um, uh, I, it pains me to give this example, but the if you remember, there was a um, an awful uh, incident in a shopping mall, the Westlake shopping mall in, in Nairobi, um, where terrorists kidnapped a load of people in the in the mall, um, and uh, and so the it was too too severe a problem for the police, so the the army was called in. Um, and unfortunately, the, the soldiers, um, they eventually managed to restore uh, order in the shopping mall, but their first instincts were to use the shopping mall to do just that, to shop. Um, so again, that's, that's soldiers just not understand, not having internalized the real, the real mission of a soldier, which is to um, protect ordinary citizens. Um, tax, 
Um, without tax revenues, governments can't do basic things like provide economic infrastructure. And so this tends to produce um, hostile environments for, um, for business. Um, or as some of my African friends would tell me, uh, one just did tell me in my previous um, uh, Zoom, which is why it's in my mind, um, the sort of businessmen who thrive in uh, these environments are the crooks. Um, uh, uh, so, um, and because the crooks thrive, uh, the decent businesses don't want to go and go. They don't want to go there because they know they'll get out competed by the crooks. Um, uh, so, that's the problem. What's the solution to that? What's the solution? Um, um, honest leadership. Um, what's the, that, that's the political solution, obviously, honest leadership, um, that actually builds a sense of collective purpose in a society. Um, uh, but, but underlying honest leadership um, is how citizens use their votes. Um, and whilst citizens vote for the leader of their ethnic group rather than a leader who is honest, um, then that perpetuates the situation. How do we change that? Um, it can be changed, it will be changed, has been changed, um, but it, it, above all else, it's youth. It's youth who um, can break away from the old identities of ethnic group to a new identity of collective frustration with the old leaders. That's, for example, what we're seeing on the streets of, uh, of Nigeria at the moment a youth rebellion against the corrupt leadership, corrupt and autocratic leadership. Um, and, the, and that's the sort of social movement that then gradually reforms uh, the political leadership and that allows the political leadership to rebuild the, um, the institutions. Um, the institutions have got the right mandates but they need people who've internalized the mission. Yeah. Um, uh, that's already happened in some societies in Africa. I mean, the, the most amazing turnaround um, is Rwanda, um, which you know, just 25 years ago was the ultimate fragile state. Um, highly polarized, um, awful. And um, uh, and yet Rwanda now, um, you've got um, its institutions work really pretty well. Um, it's got a good rule of law um, and um, uh, pretty effective tax collection and so on. Um, uh, and there's, um, obviously there's still problems, it'll be, 50 years before we know whether Rwanda successfully turned around. Um, but so far, it looks pretty impressive. Um, so that's an example of, of, a, of a turnaround which, uh, which rebuilt a, a state. Um, Ghana's in the process of that at the moment, um, pretty successfully, I think. Um, Senegal as well. And um, and Ethiopia, except that it's just plunged into um, these sort of disastrous uh, ethnic loyalties, um, which hopefully won't, uh, won't, won't derail it. So that's the internal problems. And then there's the, the, the problem that can't be solved internally and can only be solved externally. And that is the, the problem that Firms in a modern economy are interdependent. Remember, they either cluster together um, uh, or they're in a value chain dependent on all the other firms in that chain. Um, 
And so if you're very short of firms, um, there's whole sectors where none of that has happened, where there isn't a cluster, where there isn't a value chain. Um, and so those have to be, those need to start and think of the economics of pioneering either a cluster or a value chain. Who's going to volunteer to be the first in a cluster or the first firm in a value chain? Right? If you think about it for a couple of minutes, you'll see that um, nobody uh, in their right mind wants to be the pioneer in a cluster because it might not become a cluster. Yeah. If there's a, a cluster will only form if other firms decide to come. And that's their decision, not yours. You can't do anything about it. And so there is a pioneer penalty and quite a big one um, in creating either a cluster or a value chain. Um, uh, it's very different if you're pioneering technology. In the, you know, in the, in the, the, the most advanced economies, when we think of pioneers, we think of Google or whatever, and they are pioneering a new technology. And there, there's a first mover advantage. Um, often you can patent it, you can get brand recognition, all that jazz. So there's a first mover advantage when you're at the frontiers uh, of a technology. But if you're trying to build a cluster or a value chain, there's a first mover disadvantage. I suppose you need five firms before a cluster becomes viable. Everybody wants to be firm number five. Okay? And if everybody waits to be firm number five, there's never a cluster. Okay? Same with the value chain. So what do you do about that? What's the solution? It's not something that can be solved within um, an African country. Um, uh, it's something that can be solved, but the uh, entity that can solve it is, uh, is outside Africa. It's the public agencies that deal with firms and they're called development finance institutions. Britain's got one of the best in the world, CDC, um, old Commonwealth Development Corporation. Uh, the World Bank Group has got one, the biggest in the world, called IFC. Um, European Union's got one. Well, sorry, I should say Europe's got one, which is the um, EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, so these are the agencies which directly deal with firms, uh, but they use public money. And so what should be happening is that public money from aid agencies should finance these development finance institutions to subsidize pioneering. The, the, right, let me give you one very practical example of a cost. The first firm in a new sector will find that there aren't any skills for the sector. No skills have been developed, right? So all the skilled people needed for the sector will have to be trained by foreigners coming in and training. Okay? Bringing in foreigners to train locals, very expensive cost. Right? Then suppose a second, suppose it works and a second firm comes in. Where will that second firm get its skilled labor? Okay. It, much cheaper strategy than bringing in more foreigners to train. You just offer the workers in the first firm a bit more money, you poach them. Okay. So there's the challenge. That's why um, it's another example of a pioneer disadvantage. So somebody's got to pay for training the workers in the first few firms. And it can't be the first few firms, otherwise they won't come. Right? So that's the sort of thing that needs to be subsidized 
by an aid agency channeling money through a development finance institution. At the moment, nobody in the world does that, which is why there are so few firms. Right? So that's the sort of aid of the future. The future of aid is really through scaling up these development finance institutions and giving them the task of bringing in these value chains and these clusters into Africa. They can then coordinate with a group of firms and bring them all in together. That's what needs to happen. Um, so um, that's what we should be supporting and we should be supporting it in the countries that look most promising, the countries which are willing to do some of these reforms themselves that improve their own business climate. Um, so it's a partnership between those governments that want to reform their, their business environments to attract in more firms. And it doesn't have to be foreign firms. There's no tension between foreign firms and local firms. We know from uh, recent research that uh, that actually the, the local firms get triggered by the foreign firms, so they're complements, not substitutes. Um, uh, there's good research on, for example, on Turkey by uh, um, uh, uh, by my, the, 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 the woman who's now the chief economist of EBRD, um, the Arte de Borgia. So that's the top end strategy. Um, there needs to be a very, very different strategy for the bottom end. Um, the bottom end is what to do with fragile states. And I think I haven't got time at the moment to talk about a bottom end strategy for fragile states, but I'm happy to um, be pushed into it in questions. Um, uh, the essence of it is a, is a report that I work, did with Tim Besley a couple of years ago called Escaping the Fragility Trap, which is um, everything that we've been doing in fragile states as an international community has been wrong. And so reverse all the strategies we uh, have done typically in Afghanistan or whatever, um, uh, uh, don't do that, um, but I'm happy to, do, to talk about that in questions. Um, yeah, so let me pass back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Collier, for that extremely informative talk and understanding like the gestalt view when it comes to Africa, be it like the political, the social and the economic dimensions. And I think we all got a multidimensional perspective on both the systemic issues, the solutions, and at the same time, what Africa has been doing right when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic, especially the point about evolutionary bio biology, which I think we all found pretty interesting. And yeah, I'll just open the floor to questions. So if there's anyone who has a live question they'd wanna ask, there are quite a few questions in the chat as well. But if there's anyone who has a live question, you can just click the raise hand button on the bottom of your screen. So is there anyone who'd like to ask the question? Uh, hi, sir, Professor Collier, truly an honor to be present here and uh, listening to your ideas. I'm personally a huge fan of the work that you've been doing. So I had a question. Um, I think a couple of years ago, I was reading a small article that you wrote about how railway connectivity between African states can act and investment into transportation infrastructure is something that can actually solve uh, the, I mean, let's say, an, a part of the economic uh, problem within Africa, simply because, you know, you've got the landlocked states, I mean, a number of landlocked states. But developing from the COVID-19 crisis, how do you think that particular uh, proposal that you made at that time would change simply because, you know, states and, I mean, the, the, the pandemic has forced countries to start becoming self-reliant in one way? Thank you. Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, Actually, one of the really interesting responses to COVID um, has been that African governments have started to cooperate. Um, they've, they've started to work together, for example, over the vaccine. Um, they realized that 
if they were going to compete against each other, they'd all end up with no vaccine. And so they banded together very effectively. Um, and the African Union um, has, uh, has become much improved, much more effective during, because of COVID, it was such an obviously dangerous thing for Africa, that the African Union brought a much more cooperation around specific purposes um, and done a really good job. Um, the same with the Economic Commission for Africa, which is very well led by Vera Songwa. And um, uh, so for the first time in many years, Africa's now displaying an effective capacity to cooperate between governments. And that's what's needed um, to uh, connect trade. The, the, the big impediments to trade in Africa, some are transport infrastructure, but mostly it's been barriers at the border, barriers at the borders. And so um, getting, there's, a, there's now some real momentum about an African free trade area. And that would join up Africa. And that would be very, very valuable why? Because the typical African state is a very, very small market. And some of the, econo the economies of scale I was talking about were within a single firm. But actually, there's a very, very important collective um, uh, 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 economy of scale, uh, which is competition. Um, and um, uh, the combination, it's very hard for a very small market to combine scale at the level of the firm with competition at the level of the market. The market just isn't big enough to sustain a lot of firms. And so you've got, you can get scale, but the price you pay is um, monopoly power. Um, or you can get competition and the price you pay is tiny scale. Um, and so by bringing um, uh, countries together in trade, um, you get another huge benefit from, uh, from scale, which is, which is competition. And competition then drives um, uh, increases in, in productivity. That's the, that's the dynamic. Of, uh, of rising productivity. Um, and so just to go back to, to that point, that COVID's actually triggered quite a lot of momentum behind practical cooperation between African governments. And that may well sort of extend over to, um, to, to the trade dimension within Africa. Um, it's also the case that although Africa is going to become more self-sufficient vis-a-vis China and Europe and North America. It doesn't have to become more self-sufficient vis-a-vis um, -vis each single country within Africa. Um, on the contrary, um, it'll be much more effective um, if, uh, if, if we could, um, as it were, uh, stick countries together within Africa um, uh, uh, Tony Venables and I did a, a, a sort of simulation experiment on if you could sort of rub out um, some borders, um, uh, cities, around, cities, pretty well all cities will get bigger. Um, and those bigger cities would, would both achieve and reflect um, uh, higher productivity of scale. Um, so now to come back to your transport point, um, yes, Africa needs railways, it still needs railways. Um, uh, Ethiopia was, was building a, a railway to the coast and um, nearly finished. Um, and disgracefully, it didn't get enough support from uh, entities like the World Bank. Um, and so it was, driven to finance a lot of its transport infrastructure from, um, 
from China or from commercial bonds. Same is true, incidentally. I mean, there are, if you want, the two vital ingredients to productivity in a firm are connectivity and energy. Um, connectivity means roads and rail and airports. Uh, energy means electricity. And the obvious electricity for a lot of Africa is hydro. And hydro was blocked um, because um, a few uh, Western NGOs um, uh, lobbied against dams. And so, for example, DFID wouldn't fund dams. World Bank wouldn't fund dams. Um, so a, a few Western NGOs um, uh, with some good intentions, but very bad understanding of economics, blocked a totally vital process. Um, you know, the NGOs won't listen to me, but they will listen to you. Huh? You're the right age, you've got the education, you can do a lot to shift the thinking of NGOs. Please do so. Huh? Africa needs dams. Um, you know, I grew up in Sheffield. Um, just outside Sheffield is a huge reservoir, the Lady, Lady Bower Reservoir, which is, um, provides all the drinking water for Sheffield. Huh? And when I was a kid at 10, it was a drought, and the water level dropped in the Lady Bower Dam, and we could see the spire of the old church um, in the village that had been flooded. Now that village had probably been there a thousand years. Yeah? Um, so do you think the people in that village said, oh, it doesn't matter, it was flooders. Yeah? Um, uh, they're compensated. Um, but do you think you can compensate an old lady of 80 who's lived there all her life and all her neighbors have lived there? Of course not, right? And so what Sheffield did, it was the first socialist town in the whole of Europe, what Sheffield did was say, sorry, you're going to have to be relocated because half a million people need that drinking water. Yeah. Was that an abuse of human rights? No, it was a collective human right and drinking water. Right? Please tell the NGOs that. Right? Please. You know, um, they're doubtless silly young people in Sheffield um, funding campaigns to stop Ethiopia having the reservoirs from which they drink every morning, you know? So you're much more powerful in that because you understand social media. I don't. I'm terrified of it, right? You use it. Thank you. Sorry, that was a very long, long answer to a very good question. Thank you so much for that, Professor Collier. We are running a little over time, but there seem to be quite a few people on the call still. And if you're open to a question or two more, Sure. Sure. Okay. sure. Yeah. So I'll just ask the most upvoted question from the chat, which is from Shabak, who, who is talking about judicial reform. And he asks you, uh, what is, since you know, the power of the judiciary ultimately should be concentrated in the hands of individuals, is concentrated in the hands of individual people. What is the best way African countries can go about ensuring that judges make decisions using only the rule of law? Yeah. Um, uh... That's a very good question. I'm not sure I have a very good answer. Um, the, um, but I think the answer comes back to that journalist. Right? Um, that journalist was doing um, scrutiny and, um, and it was pretty effective. Um, you know, once he released those videos, um, there was then immense pressure to actually, you know, um, uh, uh, punish those judges. Right? Um, and so um, uh, the, you know, the third estate journalism um, and, and, and a press that's free enough. But you don't even need a free press anymore because you've got social media. So social media at its best um, can even bypass the need for a free press, um, as long as you know, as young people can organize into networks where they pass on um, uh, 
revelations of judicial corruption and organize protests around it, um, that can be pretty effective, but that's the sort of thing that's needed. Right? Um, and so again, it's, you know, social media can be a huge force for good or a huge force for bad. Right? And we've seen both. We see both in Africa. Right? Um, a lot of the damage in Ethiopia was done by um, ethnic diasporas in America inciting people to cleanse their region of the uh, of the minority ethnic groups. So there are you know three million Ethiopians displaced from the region they were living in because they were an ethnic minority in that region. Um, and that started not in Ethiopia, it started um, with the ethnic diasporas in America um, using social media. So social media can be very dangerous. Um, but it can also be enormously healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I think we can take one last question. I think Professor Armin Dalis, you had a question, which we can just... Uh, you're muted, I think. Yes, Paul, I always think of Africa uh, and uh, Latin America uh, having uh, a lot of common features or sharing a many common features, some very bad ones, such as uh, income inequalities, uh, and uh, some very good ones, such as uh, uh, having, uh, you know, uh, uh, Puerto Rico's or uh, uh, Dominican Republic that actually uh, didn't go through industrialization and managed to succeed just as much as Rwanda, uh, jumping up directly into services. And uh, uh, for that, yes, you might need scale, but you rely on, uh, on, 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 on foreigners or less uh, the, the purchasing power of the, of the, of the, of the vast majority of uh, low-income people increases and has access to golf courses, et cetera, et cetera. So don't you don't you don't you believe that the our comparative advantage? I don't talk about Mexico because Mexico is a different story. It's the only industrialized uh, country in Latin America. But don't you think that our comparative advantage uh, is in primary commodities? Look at Chile. Chile has very 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 strong institutions and still reliant on copper. You know. So um, uh, how 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 can we uh, sort of get out uh, as late industrializers and gain scale is a mystery for me. Well, I think there's a lot of, I'm glad you made that comparison because I think there's a lot of similarities between Africa and Latin America, especially as a result of COVID. You know, you've got, you've got the same hits of commodity price falling and so on. Um, um, I, I mean, for, I'm, for some reason, I'm very much in demand in Latin America at the moment. So I've done, um, this month, Zooms, two Zooms to Brazil, um, a Zoom to Argentina, the main, the main business conferences in Brazil, Argentina, and I've just got to do Chile, I think next week. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but it seems to me that in, in, in all three of those cases, you've got um, uh, extreme inequality, which actually um, is, is compounding the problem. Um, uh, so that when you've got a lot of inequality, an economic shock produces extreme social tensions. Um, and uh, I'm a communitarian. I, I'm just, just in this, I'm allowed to have, I've just done a book called Greed is Dead. Um, and Greed is Dead is, a, is a, about the, the virtues of uh, coming together around common purposes. Um, and that's the secret of Denmark, of New Zealand, of Norway. They're able to come together around common purposes, um, whether they are get rid of COVID um, or many other common purposes. In Latin America, um, you're pretty bad at coming around common purposes, except as you point out in some wonderful places like Costa Rica. I work with the president of Costa Rica, 
on uh, trying to encourage other Central American countries to have a mutual de-escalation of military spending uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, but generally in Latin America, what's missing is that ability to forge common purpose. And um, uh, that's a fixable problem. Um, let me end with plugging another wonderful book, not by me, um, but late Robert Putnam's latest book called Upswing, uh, which is a very heartening book uh, because he shows that um, it's perfectly possible for an unequal society to actually build um, a more equal society on common purpose is because upswing is about how America did it between 1900 and the 1960s. So um, Latin America needs an upswing. It wouldn't hurt in Britain either. <laughs> thank um, you very so much, Professor Collier. And that sort of brings us to the end of the event. So a big thank you from the Economist Society and the UCL Department of Economics to you, sir. Uh, Collier for taking out the time from your busy schedule and sort of coming and speaking with us and we hope you enjoyed the event as much as we did.